Okay, uh, McDougall back with you this morning. Um, and my task to introduce our penultimate speaker, Samuel Helfont. I'm very proud to say, very gratified to say that he works for me. <laughs> Sam, as uh, we managed to finagle an appointment for him, not, uh, he was overqualified for the job, but we, we have sneaked him in to uh, our faculty uh, in the International Relations Program at the University of Pennsylvania, where, uh, unless something better comes along, he will be for at least three years. And if you read the short bio that you have uh, in your packet on Samuel Helfond, it will you know, obviously establish his credentials. Uh, he's got the requisite degrees. He's done a certain scholar scholarship, published in certain journals, and all that is good. Uh, but that doesn't tell half of the life story of Samuel Helfond. He's really, he looks so young, you know. But in fact, um, he has pursued at least two complete careers, one in the military and one in uh, academic life. He's a graduate of the University of Maryland, burp a terp, That's right. uh, and he took an MA degree from Tel Aviv University and received his PhD in Near Eastern Studies from Princeton. He has published, as you can read in your, in the, uh, on the sheet here, he has published widely in uh, the journals uh, specializing in the Middle East and in general American foreign policy. Uh, he's the author of two monographs. He's provided us at FPRI with so many erudite articles and lectures. But the one that I recall particularly was several years ago when he gave us a gripping, gripping account based on the captured archives of Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq, both the state archives and the Ba'ath Party archives, which of course were far more revealing, just as the Communist Party archives would be far more revealing than the state documents of the Soviet government. Uh, and it's t it was entitled, what, was, what War Planners Got Wrong? And sure enough, uh, Sam briefed us on how Pathetically, the CIA in particular and the Bush administration in general had done their homework or understood uh, the politics of the regime that they were prepar preparing to overthrow. Uh, he is, I mentioned his military service, he is a lieutenant in the United States Naval Reserve. He has served four full years of active duty over that span, including uh, his time in Iraq. His topic today is um, well, you can see it, post-colonial status uh, and the struggle for identity since World War II. Please welcome Sam Helfont. Okay, thank you uh, very much. And of course, as is usually the case, uh, Walter, thank you for that wonderful introduction, though you did leave off my, my largest accolade, which is I am the husband of Tali Helfont. Uh, who brought you all here today. But yes, uh, I've done a few of these now, these uh, history institutes, they're always, uh, it's always a pleasure. My high school self is sort of saying, ah, you know, how the tables have turned, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so today I was asked to speak about post-colonial states, uh, particularly with relation to identity. Um, if you get a bunch of historians of the Middle East around and you start talking about identity in the 20th century, especially since World War II, this term is going to come up, post-colonial. Um, it's not always clear what it means. Um, today I will hopefully clarify a little bit of different ways it has been used and um, how that is affected or how it may affect, depending on what you think this term means, um, identity. Right. So just a basic overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, first, we'll talk about different ways this term post-colonial has been used, different definitions for it. Uh, the way it's affected ideology, identity, and, you know, uh, in, in the Middle East. And then finally, I'm going to take you through uh, three case studies, which will draw out some of the details of uh, what I'm trying to, uh, of the point I'm trying to get across, right? Okay. So, what does it mean to be post-colonial? Um, I was thinking about this, um, and I came up with these three categories. These are just my categories, so, um, you know, other people may look at this 
uh, in different ways, right? But the temporal, uh, about the nature of states and politics, and finally there's a way uh, to discuss post-colonial as, as a relationship with, with modernity, right? So get right into it. The first is a temporal definition of post-colonial. This is the most basic, simple definition, right? The Middle East was ruled by empires until the 20th century. Um, in the 19th and early 20th century, those were mostly uh, colonial, European empires, right? And therefore, uh, a post-colonial state is simply a state that comes out of one of these colonial empires. Very simple, very basic, right? Uh, you can see the map here, it's very clear. Europeans are up there, and the bottom map has, you know, the, the states and the dates that they um, achieve some sort of independence, right? But that's not the only way to, uh, to discuss post-colonial states post-colonial politics. Uh, second way is a particular type of state um, and a particular type of politics which is sometimes called post-colonial. Uh, these post-colonial states that emerge out of these colonial empires inherit a lot of the political institutions that these colonial empires had created. Um, so for example, military leaders uh, who often emerged as the, the leaders of, of uh, the post-colonial states uh, were brought up and served in the militaries of, that were established by the British and the French and, and sometimes um, even the Ottomans. Uh, sometimes the internal security services of, of these states were also uh, developed by the colonial rulers. Um, Saddam Hussein's uh, secret police of Amin al-Am uh, was actually designed by the British and it had been, uh, it was a British uh, legacy, right? Now, the way that these colonial powers had designed these institutions and these militaries and security forces was to basically control the populations that they were, um, that they were governing, right? So, uh, as opposed to sort of, we might think of a Western military, which is designed to fend off militaries from other states, uh, a colonial, the militaries of the colonial empires built and that were, you know, remain in place, uh, were designed to sort of protect the state from its own population, right? And people who, uh, who like this theory of post-colonial states will say, yes, and they continue to do so, you know, in, uh, in the post-colonial period, right? So if you think about that kind of state which is imposed, which is protecting itself from its own citizens, it's very much a top-down phenomenon, just like colonial rule was. It's sort of imposed on, um, on the population, um, and therefore those who would, uh, who like this theory would, would say, yeah, it's not, it shouldn't be surprising that these post-colonial states are largely non-democratic, right, because this is not something from the bottom up, it's not something from the people, it's something imposed, right. Um, because it's imposed, because the state is imposed, they're also said to be fairly weak states, right? Post-colonial states are said to be uh, weak states in that they have trouble, they have trouble getting society to do the things that they want to do, right? And they often have to revert to great violence in order to uh, push the society to um, carry out the policies uh, and the programs that the state designs, right? So this sort of weak state, uh, there's a stronger society that People are used to relying on the social fabric, you know, tribe and village and, and whatnot, as opposed to the state. Um, and the state has this difficulty getting its policies through, usually resorts uh, to violence to do so. Um, because of this weak state status, they've also been susceptible to coups. Here's a list of uh, coups that have taken place in the uh, post-colonial Middle East. As you can see, it's, uh, it's quite a lot, right? Uh, and the coups sort of compound the problem, right? Because if you think of the nature of a coup, usually a military leader will take over a state, right? Uh, and once they do so, they are quite skeptical of that state, of the institutions that they've just taken over, because they don't want someone to do to them what they just did to somebody else. Um, so again, they have trouble sort of uh, imposing themselves on the state itself and on society, which uh, sometimes leads to uh, more violence. Now, if you notice on here, there 
I have listed here Turkey and Iran. Uh, they show up in here, right? So Turkey and Iran, as we've heard from others, were never formally colonized, right? Um, so they would not fit that first definition of a temporal definition of what is post-colonial. Um, but historians or scholars who, who like to speak about post-colonial uh, in, in this way would sometimes include Iran and Turkey uh, as, you know, because they have a similar nature of their politics, right? So we're talking about post-colonial in the nature of politics and not as a temporal category. Then you could include, um, you could include places like Turkey and Iran. Now, this definition of post-colonial is um, quite common, but it is by no means universal, uh, and it is disputed. There are people who say uh, this term post-colonial has been, the colonial legacy has been overemphasized, right? And that these states, though they happen to come out of colonial empires, operate in very much the same way that other non-democratic authoritarian states operate. Um, so, for example, states like the USSR, a non-democratic state, also sometimes had a great deal of difficulty getting its population to do the things that it wanted it to do, and often resorted to great amounts of violence in order to make them do that, in fact. But they were never colonized. In fact, they were often the colonizers. Uh, on the flip side, there are states which were clearly temporarily post-colonial, right? Uh, but didn't, don't have this type of politics and don't have this type of state which is described as post-colonial. So Costa Rica, Israel, Ireland, the United States itself could be called post-colonial, right? We come out of a colonial empire. Uh, but these states are democratic and they don't really fit this, this mold. So um, there is some debate about how useful the term is, right? Um, um, and that debate will, um, will continue. So there is a final definition of, at least in my categories, of post-colonial. This definition, I would say, is uh, it's a little bit more controversial. It has to do with a critique of modernity. Um, it's really in the sort of school of, of post, post-modernism. And uh, scholars who adhere to this, uh, this school, I guess you could say, of thought, um, look at at concepts which in the West we may consider to be rationalized concepts, concepts that somebody sat around and, and thought through with logic and, um, and, and created, like capitalism, like liberalism, like secularism, right? Um, which we view as, as universal, because anybody who has uh, reason can, can basically think through these problems and come up with the same solutions. Well, post-colonial scholars who, who uh, and, and these things generally are what we call modernity, right? Um, post-colonial scholars would say, no, actually, these aren't universal concepts that just smart people sat around and thought about. These actually come out of a particular Western experience, right? Um, and they cannot be simply imposed on another part of the world which didn't have that particular Western experience. The one example I have up here, which actually Jonathan Berkey mentioned as well, right? Uh, if you're talking about secularism, we think of secularism or as, you know, uh, Aaron Rock Singer also um, discussed. You know, we think of secularism as the West oftentimes as this sort of uh, putting religion aside, right? Pushing, pushing religion outside of the public sphere, sort of doing away with, with religion as a, as a public, right? Uh, if you're a post-colonial scholar, you'll say, no, actually, that's what you're describing there is just Christianity, right? Because in Christianity, you have this concept of give unto Caesars what is Caesars, give unto God what is God's, uh, and this comes out of Christianity. It doesn't come out of other religious traditions, and therefore trying to impose uh, these ideas of secularism onto other societies is almost, in a way, imposing a type of uh, post-Christianity, right? Or a Christian concept. Um, now, some of these scholars have also linked, it's very common to link these ideas to Western power, um, and imperialism, and part of the imperial project was to impose these sort of Western categories on, on other societies as a means of sort of ruling and, and, and um, controlling them, right? So as I mentioned, you know, this is not 
in any way agreed on, agreed upon by everyone, uh, and is also oftentimes uh, quite controversial. Um, the critics would say that you know many of the problems that are facing in the Middle East with liberalism are the same problems that are faced in the West with liberalism, women's rights, uh, what have you. I think uh, Jonathan Berkey went through a, a good. Um, uh, gave a good example of how the critics would, would, would talk about secularism um, in the Western tradition, that this certainly, secularism wasn't the, the policy of the church for when the church was in power, and it wasn't the policy of the Christian world for uh, most of the Christian world's existence, so how could you call this a Christian policy? These are actually post-enlightenment, these are enlightenment, uh, these, are, these are ideas that come out of the enlightenment, and not out of Christianity, not out of a particular uh, Western experience. So um, those debates will, uh, will continue. So now we've sort of discussed um, what post-colonialism, or, or different ways to understand post-colonialism, because those three ways are sometimes mutually exclusive, sometimes not, sometimes they, they overlap. Um, but those are three different ways to think about what someone might mean when they use the term uh, post-colonial. Right? So why is this sort of post-colonial um, discussion important when we're discussing identity and political identities, particularly in the Middle East? Well, the colonial empires, in most cases, not, not, not in all cases, but in most cases, the colonial empires didn't simply give up power. Right? They didn't simply say, oh, we're going home. Right? Uh, there were movements within the colonized people, um, which agitated against the empire for independence, all right? Um, and the way this works, political identity obviously needs to play a sort of large role, right? Because if you don't have a political identity which is different than the ruling empire, why be independent, right? Why not be Ohio in the United States, right? Uh, no, so the, the leaders of these movements which were sort of agitating for independence always usually did so in the name of some what they would consider to be an authentic indigenous political identity, which is different from that of the empire. And they want to come to power and rule in the name of this authentic indigenous identity. Right? Uh, this manifested differently in different places. In the Middle East, usually it was a mix. This identity was a mix, some sort of mix of ethnic nationalism, territorial nationalism, um, and religion. And you know, each location provided different sort of cultural and historical uh, building blocks to construct this identity. Um, even with those same building blocks, though, sometimes it was constructed differently. So for example, in Egypt, which we've heard about, um, you have the Arab nationalists, such as Gamal Abdel Nasser, um, who at least eventually uh, would cr create a sort of identity which is based on Egypt, right, being from Egypt. Uh, being Muslim, Islam was actually a part of his, his sort of rings of identity that he talked about, but more than anything else, Arab. So he had Arab, he had Egyptian, and he had Muslim, but he put Arab on top as the most important. Uh, within the same country, in the same sort of cultural building blocks, the Muslim Brotherhood at the same time would say, yes, they were very much Egyptian, they talked about Egypt, they liked Egypt, they talked about being Arab, but they put being Muslim on top, right? So they just sort of racked and stacked these in different ways, and they would come into sort of conflict uh, over the way that they racked and stacked them. In different places, this, this played out differently. You know, in Egypt, I mean, in uh, Syria and Lebanon, uh, you had people discussing the sort of Mediterranean, even Greek uh, identity, right? Um, in, in Iraq, you had the Mesopotamian uh, influences, and in Persia, you know, you still have this ancient Persian, you know, pre-Islamic Persian. Uh, empires which play an important part um, in these identities, right? So once the colonial powers leave and one of these groups comes to power based on this authentic indigenous identity, they run into some problems because their legitimacy and legitimacy of the state they're trying to build is based on this political identity which they've been saying is the authentic political identity of this place, right? But the Middle East, um, as we've seen, is, is, is quite a diverse place. Um, and it has a lot of different 
uh, minorities and, and groups which don't fit neatly into these categories which are constructed by um, the post-colonial post -colonial rulers. I think uh, at the end of Lev's talk yesterday, he did a good job of saying one of the legacies of colonialism is that many of the minorities were actually tied to uh, the old empires, right? Sometimes because the empires, the colonial empires, like to use them in this sort of divide and conquer type of way, and sometimes because the, the minorities themselves um, looked, tied themselves to the colonial rulers as, as a means of, of gaining, um, gaining protection, right? So these people were, were, were these sort of minorities, uh, were inconvenient, you could say, for, uh, for a leader who's saying that I represent the authentic indigenous political identity of this country when not everybody in that country actually is, you know, adheres to, to, that, um, to that identity. And what you have is them facing a problem, right? And it's not only that these, that these other identities exist, but these all, uh, other identities are usually quite powerful uh, and linked to the old colonial order, right? So then the, then the new state becomes independent and it has to ask itself, um, what does independence mean? Is it simply a formal recognition of independence, or do we need to sort of take the state apart and take the old, take the old order apart and build it? Oops, sorry, uh, and build a new order based upon this sort of new uh, post-colonial identity, right? Um, and that has created a lot of different uh, conflicts within the region, right? Uh, the problem is, of course is this is what the sort of ethnic fabric of the Middle East looks like, and you can see it doesn't, it doesn't match the border. So anyone who's trying to impose this sort of identity is, is not going to uh, be so successful. Now you could say that, and, and a lot of people you'll hear that, oh, you know, it's because the borders were drawn wrong by colonial rulers who drew straight lines. That's partly true, but it's also not. I mean, even if you looked at some areas like, for example, in Saudi Arabia where everyone is, you know, Arab, and you think, okay, great, well, why do, you know, we just make a state like that, you know, based on these lines, but as soon as you do that, you realize that ethnic identity isn't the only identity, and it's actually the same map that uh, Lev was using yesterday. You see that, well, you know, if you divide things up on, on religious lines, which is another important cultural building block, uh, you know, the lines would be different. So there's no real good way to do this, right? And if you're a sort of post-colonial leader trying to create one identity for your state, um, you're going to have problems um, no matter what you do, right? You're going to come into conflict with parts of your society uh, which do not like this program that you're trying to impose, right? So let's look how this actually played out in, a, uh, in these three cases um, that I discussed. So the first is the case of Egypt. Uh, Egypt in the early 20th century, which a few people have have alluded to um, was actually uh, very cosmopolitan. It was a sort of cosmopolitan center. It was a, a British colony, um, but it had new and old communities uh, which um, were Greek, were Jewish, were Turkish, were Italian. There were whole classes uh, of people in Cairo and Alexandria who could barely get by in Arabic. They spoke French. Or, or something else like that, right? Uh, many of these people were referred to as uh, mutamasarun, which means sort of Egyptianized, Egyptianized um, people. Um, and there is some, I would say, nostalgia in Egypt um, in certain sectors for, the, for this period. Now, you can see it here's a you know, poster for a movie based on a, 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 I guess, a very successful book you know, about this building called the Jacobian Building, which um, represented this sort of diversity. All these different people lived in, 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 in this building. Jacobian is a, you know, it's an Armenian name, actually. And, you know, the building sort of, the people are, are, are kind of leave and are replaced by uh, Arab uh, military officers, right? And so this was popular, I would say, you know, over the last decade and a half, two decades, this book and movie, um, and kind of shows this sort of longing for the lost cosmopolitanism uh, of Egypt. To give you just a, a hint of what this cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism looked like, I've pulled from a couple different uh, memoirs. These are both of, of Jews who, who lived in Egypt um, 
and during this time and left. Um, the first is from a book called Out of Egypt. It's, it's a really fun memoir uh, to read. Um, and the author describes his uncle as a Turco-Italian, Anglophile, gentrified, fascist Jew who started life peddling Turkish fezes in Berlin and Vienna and was to end up the sole auctioneer of the deposed King Farouk's property. Um, so clearly, someone who has a very cosmopolitan life, uh, Farouk was the king of, of Egypt, right? Um, but he was also outside of Egypt, you know, a little bit. There was also this cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism, in, cosmopolitanism within Egypt itself. And the second quote from uh, a different memoir, The Man with the White Sharkskin Suit, another excellent uh, memoir. Um, and the author describes her father, right, uh, who had never actually left the Arab world until he's, he leaves Egypt, right? So this isn't someone with this European background. He said, and she says, he began each day praying with his fellow Jews. He did business with French colonial merchants and Greek entrepreneurs. He gambled with wealthy Egyptians, including on occasion the king, and he socialized with British officers stationed in Cairo. So this is someone who did all of this in Egypt itself, right? So very cosmopolitan. Now, when Egypt becomes independent in 1922, uh, this sort of cosmopolitanism doesn't go away. And uh, these people who are tied to the old ruling order, these sort of minorities, uh, whether they're ethnic or religious or linguistic, um, sort of maintain a, a type of, uh, a good type of position within Egypt, right? But anti-imperialist movements who sort of position themselves against the old colonial order are developing, whether they are Arab nationalists or um, the Muslim Brotherhood, right? Um, and they sort of cooperate. Uh, they're able to cooperate because they see, say, see a shared threat of what they consider neo-imperialist, even if imperialism doesn't exist formally, right? Uh, Arab nationalists eventually won, win. Kamal Abdel Nasser comes to, to power. Uh, the coup is in 52. He comes to power officially in 54. Um, and he begins an Arabization process, right? Um, stricturing the rights of these mutamasarun, these sort of Egyptianized uh, people, right? So he imposes Arabic of the, as a sole language in higher education, in the bureaucracy, and many of these elites who had worked in Egypt uh, can't get by in Arabic, right? Even some of the, you know, really Egyptian Arabized Arabized people, um, uh, you know, they, they basically studied in French and they functioned in French or, or Italian or, or some other language, right, or English. Um, so this sort of uh, pushes these people to the side. Nasser also has a, um, a nationalization project of, of different businesses and land re redistribution, which uh, targets disproportionately um, people who also come from this sort of cosmopolitan background uh, linked to, you know, the old colonial order. Um, and finally, there are um, some expulsions from Egypt. Now, one of the complicating factors here is that many of the people who uh, were in Egypt, many of the religious and ethnic uh, minorities, were able to obtain citizenship during the colonial period on, uh, from some other European power, right? Now, um, they did so because it had all sorts of benefits and protections involved, but many of them had never actually lived in or been to the country, Italy or France or wherever it was, uh, w which had given them a passport. It was sort of for practical reasons. They would find some strange connection and, and, and get a, uh, a passport. Um, so there's this sort of link of foreignness to them as well as foreign citizenship. Uh, and after Nasher comes into power, you know, they're marginalized and, and many of the people with these foreign passports, um, even if they've been in Egypt for you know, hundreds of years, are, are, are expelled. Um, this comes particularly in 1956. There is a war. Uh, Nasser nationalizes the Suez Canal and the French, British, and Israelis attack. Um, they invade the country and in the wake of this, Nasser basically kicks out um, you know, anyone who's connected to any of these countries, which was most of the Jews, uh, the Italians, the Greeks. I mean, basically what you have is a 
homogenization of Egypt, uh, which occurs um, and really is continuing to occur, occur to some extent, but really in the mid-decades of the 20th century, Egypt goes from being cosmopolitan to increasingly um, an Arab, and, and today, you know, more and more Muslim um, country, right? So that's the first case. The second happy case is Iraq. Iraq was an Ottoman territory uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. The British take it during World War I and make it into a, a mandate. Um, they bring a king, Faisal, uh, sort of uh, make him king of Iraq. He's not from Iraq. He's an Arab nationalist from uh, the area of Mecca, Medina, uh, who helped the British. He fought next to Lawrence of Arabia in World War I, and as a sort of reward, because some other things didn't work out for him, they make him the king of Iraq. So his, his rule is very much linked to this sort of colonial, uh, colonial project, right? Um, Iraq isn't as cosmopolitan as Egypt in the early 20th century, and that doesn't have these sort of international ties and, and people you know, speaking all these French and, and, and Italian and Greek and whatnot, right? Although it is much more diverse um, than Egypt was. If you remember back to all the different groups that Lev described yesterday, they basically are all, except for maybe the cops, you know, they're, they're all in Iraq. So you have Arab, Sunnis and Shis, you have Kurdish, Sunnis and Shis, you have Turkmen, you have Christians, and the Christians are Syrians and Chaldeans and Roman Catholics and Armenians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, even Protestants. Uh, you have Jews, you have Baha'is, you have Yazidis, you, you have everything there, right? This big mix, right? Um, and many of these groups were actually quite uh, important, and they, they, they were important in population centers. So I always sort of ask people if they know what the largest group in Baghdad was uh, in the interwar period. Uh, and most people have no idea that the largest group in Baghdad uh, was Jews. Jews were, the, were, were the, not the majority, but the, the largest single group, right? There were more Jews than Shis or Sunnis or Kurds or Christians or anything else, right? Now, like in Egypt, uh, many of these minorities were, were linked to the imperial or colonial orders, right? Uh, the empires liked using them um, as a sort of divide and rule, and they liked being um, connected to uh, the empires because it gave them some sort of extra leeways and benefits and protections, right? Now this was great when the empires and colonial powers were there. It was horrible uh, once they left. So the Assyrians, so Iraq becomes independent in 1932, um, and there is a massacre of the Assyrians one year later, 1933. The Assyrians were, had basically signed up as, as soldiers, uh, and they were, they were working on behalf of the British, uh, suppressing many of you know, the neighboring uh, populations, and, and as soon as the British leave, uh, these neighboring populations, you know, come back for uh, revenge, and, and they take it out on, on, on these Assyrians, and it's a sort of horrible massacre that happens up there. You know, not just the people are killed, but also their villages and, and land um, is destroyed. Um, the Jews also uh, suffer after the British leave. Um, the Jewish community in Iraq is a very was a, I should say, was a, a very uh, Im important and, and historical community. It actually dated back to the Babylonian exile, right? So this is a, a long community. It had been there for you know, a couple thousand years before you, you know, Arabs, before Islam, before anything. But they uh, began under this sort of post in this post-colonial period, they, they began to be depicted as, as foreigners, which is a sort of strange thing. Um, for a community that had been there for a couple thousand years. Um, because the British again had been, I mean, uh, the, the Jews again had, had uh, connected themselves with the old colonial order. There are many important Jewish families that took, took advantage of uh, British, you know, the sort of uh, cosmopolitan as the British Empire to sort of establish these international business networks that, that, that range from Baghdad to Manchester, England to India, right? I mean, if some of you have heard of maybe the Sassoon family, uh, you know, they were Iraqi, Iraqi Jews, very important bankers, and also makeup, I guess is, a, you know, yeah. Um, so in the 1950s, um, 
There's a lot of pressure on the Jews. There's a, there is a sort of Jewish pogrom during World War II, uh, and then in the, in the early 1950s, the Jewish community uh, flees un, under pressure, um, and most of them ended up in Israel. There were some remnants there, and, and uh, last I heard, the last Jews were outed by WikiLeaks um, because the American embassy had been sort of tracking them. You know, it was, like, it was really like five or six of them left. Uh, but the American embassy had been watching over who they were, and then uh, it, this came out in the WikiLeaks, and they, they, had to, um, they had to flee. Right? So Iraq, there's a number of coups in Iraq uh, throughout the mid-decades of the, of the 20th century. The Ba'athists eventually come to power in 1968. Um, now, Arab nationalists had basically been ruling Iraq for most of this time, but Ba'athists are, are, uh, are radical Arab nationalists, right? And they, um, and they saw Iraq... Um, as, a, as an Arab, as an Arab country, right? Um, and as, but as you can see up here on the map, on the top right, you know, Iraq is a very diverse country. It's not just simply Arab. There's Kurds, there's all these other groups. Uh, and these other groups had to deal with the state trying to impose this Arabness on them uh, in very different ways. And depending on the group, you had different, you had different options at your disposal. So if you were a Shi Arab, actually things, you know, it wasn't, the, the Iraqis did, the Ba'athists did persecute Shis, but not for being Shis, mostly for having ties to Iran. So if you were a Shi, you didn't have ties to Iran, and you wanted to be a, an Arab nationalist Ba'athist, you were actually, you were okay. You know, you, you, could, you, could, you could manage, and, and you could actually rise to the highest levels uh, of the regime. Not the highest level, because that was, you know, designated for one person, but... Um, you could get fairly high up. Right? Other groups had to negotiate this differently. The Assyrians, uh, which were in northern Iraq, are a type of ethno-religious linguistic group. They have their own language, they have their own uh, religion, and they sort of, you know, some of them will claim that they are a different ethnicity. Right? Uh, so if they depicted themselves as simply Arabs who happened to be of this Assyrian faith, then they were okay. The regime didn't mess with them too much, right? Um, but if they tried to take the next step and say, no, actually, we're also an ethno-linguistic group, they ran into big problems uh, right away and, and fairly severe um, persecution. Uh, other groups didn't even have those options. The Kurds clearly were not Arabs. Um, and they probably got the worst of it uh, during Saddam's uh, Ba'athist rule of Iraq. There were attempts to Arabize Kurdish areas, bringing Arabs from other sections of Iraq and putting them up into the Kurdish areas to try to uh, change the demographics, right? And probably the worst uh, thing that happens, uh, which is linked to a war, but also linked to the Iran-Iraq war, but also had clearly some uh, ethnic cleansing in mind, was uh, you know the Kurds were simply gassed. You know, Saddam Hussein uses. Uh, uh, chemical weapons against his own people, against the Kurds, to try to push them out of, of, of certain areas. Right? And so what you see is the state sort of trying to impose its uh, Arabness, its, its, uh, its designated political identity onto a very diverse population, and to some extent it works. You know, over the last uh, century, Iraq has become uh, much less diverse. Than, than it was, right? The same thing that sort of happened in Egypt. Now we'll move on to the last uh, case study. And this is revolutionary Iran. Now you notice there's a question mark up there. Uh, because Iran, as we discussed, was never, was never formally colonized. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, the, the, the British and the, and, and, the, and the Russians had sort of divided up Iran into, um, into spheres of influence, the spheres where they had control, but they, they never formally uh, colonized it, right? Nevertheless, because never, even though there was never some formal colonization, this sort of same in antagonism towards colonialism uh, and imperialism emerged in Iran, and some of the same issues that we saw in other post-colonial states uh, occur in Iran. This also happened, I mean, if we remember Mike Reynolds talked from yesterday about Turkey, uh, many of the same things happened with the state trying to sort of impose its, uh, its 
designated political identity on a diverse population. Uh, and anyway, Turkey follows uh, in the same pattern, even though Turkey and Iran were not um, colonized. But again, again, there are debates about whether this is just a state doing this, right? And especially a non-democratic state. Um, but sort of draw out, you know, and that really has nothing to do with, with its post-colonial status, right? But um, there are those who make this argument, and we'll, we'll go through it right now, right? So Pahlavi Iran, the Shahs of Iran, who ruled for most of the 20th century, um, for most of their rules, that most of their reign, they have links uh, to Western uh, powers, and Western powers do intervene in Iran. They're very much involved in the politics of Iran. Uh, probably the most famous incident is the incident of uh, the prime minister named Mossadegh, 1953, who tries to nationalize um, the oil industry, um, and he is overthrown uh, in a coup, which uh, the U.S. and the British supported. How much they actually caused it is, is, is debated, but they certainly uh, supported the coup, right, to say the, the minimum, all right? Uh, the Shah, who had fled during this crisis, right, uh, is put back on the throne by the Western powers, particularly the United States, right? Um, so movements in Iran sort of uh, developed, which say this is neo-imperialism, neo-colonialism, and they created, you know, authentic indigenous identities. You know, the same process occurs where they're going to sort of, uh, in opposition to Western influence, in this case what they call neo-imperialism, right? Uh, these movements came together in 1979 for the uh, Iranian revolution, right, the Islamic revolution. At first it is just a revolution, which a number of different groups, uh, just like in Egypt, you know, when Nasser comes to power, you basically have um, the cooperation of Islamists and socialists and Arab nationalists sort of all against this colonial power, and then the one that takes over, you know, in Egypt, the case it was nationalists that took over and suppressed the Islamist and the socialists. Well, in Iran, you know, you have all these groups come together, and it's the Islamists that take over and they suppress the nationalist and the socialists. So different end result, but basically the same, the same pattern. Um, so what happens is you have a uh, Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini, takes over Iran in the name of a um, Shi, a particular Shi Muslim identity. But he also has a, a Persian, uh, a Persian side to it as well, which isn't always discussed. Uh, but he's clearly, um, in some ways, a Persian nationalist as well. One great example of that is um, the, the Persian Gulf, which we know is the Persian Gulf. It's called the Arabian Gulf by the Arabs, also by the U.S. military. Uh, if you talk to someone in the U.S. military, they'll call it the Arabian, the Arabian Gulf, right? Um, and after Khomeini takes over, uh, someone says to him, hey, well, why not call it the Islamic Gulf? And just, you know, everyone wins. And he says, no, this is the Persian Gulf. And, you know, those Arabs are wrong. Uh, so it's actually a funny, if, it, I, I tried it right this morning before this lecture. Uh, a few years ago, if you Googled Arabian Gulf, there was a sort of Google bomb. The first result came up, and you clicked on it, it was an error message. It was some Iranians had done this and said, you, uh, you must be mistaken, you must mean Persian Gulf. There is no such thing as an Arabian Gulf. And it was this good error. It looked just like an error message on, you know, on your computer. Uh, but um, I, you, can re you can read about it, but the actual uh, message is gone. Right? So Khomeini really was, um, was uh, ruling in the name of this Persian Shi uh, regime. Right? This was the identity that he wanted to, to have. Right? But Iran, like other places, as you can see here, is quite diverse. Even this idea of Persian, right? A lot of people, we think of Persia and Iran as synonymous. These are the same thing. They are not the same thing. Persian is an ethnic, an ethnic group, which is probably the majority of the Iranians. Now this uh, here is sort of graph has the breakdown. The Persians here are 51%. They, it, no one knows for sure, it goes between, usually between 51 and, and 65% uh, of the country is Persian. But then there are other groups, Azaris, which are, uh, you know, speak, they call it Azari, but it's, it's kind of Turkish, you know, uh, 
and there are you know, other Kurds and, and different groups in, inside of Iran, right? There are also Sunnis, uh, Sunni Muslims in Iran. There are Christians, there are Baha'is. Um, there are some Jews left in, in Iran, right? Uh, and the Iranian state, like other, um, other similar states, has uh, really been um, attempting to impose its political identity, uh, marginalizing other languages, uh, restricting the rights of other religious groups, and attempting this homogenization, uh, this homogenization project uh, in Iran. So in many ways, people would look at this and say, even though Iran wasn't formally colonized, it could still be called a, a post-colonial uh, state, right? Um, but the Iranian example is, is a good example of why someone would say this term post-colonial has possibly been overused or over, overemphasized, uh, because of course Iran was never, was never formally colonized. Um, and that debate um, will continue, right? It's, it's by no way uh, resolved, and I, I don't think I, I resolved it here uh, on one side or the other for you today, but uh, the debate remains prominent in the history of, of the Middle East and by historians of the modern Middle East, and I hope that if, if nothing else, um, that you now have a better understanding of what that debate is about, um, and when you hear someone speaking about post-colonial projects, post-colonial states, post-colonial identities, uh, you'll have some sort of better understanding of what they're talking about. And with that, I will, oop, wrong way, upside down. Questions? Yeah. So just wait for the mics. John Rapazzo, Longview, Texas. Um, over the years, and even quite recently, I've gotten <clears throat> a distinct impression that Christians under Saddam Hussein have actually found favor um, uh, under that regime, and I want to see if you could provide any insight into that. Yeah, it's complicated. Um, Certainly, it's better than it is now. You know, this is you know that, that but that's not a very high bar. Um, Saddam liked some Christians. He liked uh, because they, they had no power, right? And there was no chance of them taking over the country. So, for example, all of Saddam Hussein's cooks were, were Christian. You know, if you're you don't want to be poisoned, um, so you know um, you make your cook a, a Christian. Uh, in the Iraqi archives itself, it's a sort of strange relationship with, with the Christians. Again, if they could show themselves to be Arabs, um, they were in an okay place. Tariq Aziz, for example, who was a foreign minister and the deputy prime minister, uh, was, was, a, was a Christian. Um, that being said, there, and, the, and the official Ba'athist uh, rhetoric, right, um, was was that it didn't really matter. We're all Arabs first, right? I mean, uh, we heard from Lev yesterday. He, one of the men he mentioned was Michel Aflac, the Syrian Christian, right, who becomes the head of the Ba'ath Party, um, who wanted to sort of Christians to recognize Islam as this cultural, uh, cultural importance of Islam, right? But he's, he's a Christian, right? There's some evidence that he converted to Islam later in life, but uh, this evidence comes from after he was dead. So we don't know how, how, how reliable that is. Um, that being said, you do find, so there's no maybe uh, de jure discrimination, but you do find de facto discrimination. For example, I found um, well, if you wanted to op open a mosque in Iraq, you had to just go through a certain process and apply, right? Uh, and, and the process was the exact same for the churches. Which, and they were actually in the same folder, in the same binder, one after the other. If you wanted to do a, it was the same form and, and the same response. The, the only difference was I've ne I never found a church that was approved. And I found tons of mosques that were approved, right? So the juro is exactly the same, but de facto there was always some reason why you wouldn't want to build a church. Uh, there was already too many, or the other one is fine, or whatever. Um, but they never said, 
because you're Christian, and they never said uh, you're going to make the Muslims upset or, or anything like that. So it was this sort of tricky, you know, this tricky, uh, they had to walk this tricky line. You know, a lot of the Christians also did have, they spoke some form of Aramaic usually. Um, and if they tried to register themselves, like on, on the Bathist cards, they would have, uh, you know, a place for um, religion and a place for ethnicity, right? If they wrote religion, Christian, ethnicity, Arab, good to go. If they wrote religion, Christian, ethnicity, Assyrian, they're in big trouble. Um, but some of them did it anyway and got in big trouble um, because they were committed to it. Um, so they had to negotiate with the state, and some of them did it better than others. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's really all you, all you can say. But there's certainly a nostalgia amongst Christians today for that period um, because since the fall of 2003, I mean, it's been a disaster. Uh, you know, since the fall of that regime in 2003, it's been an absolute disaster for Iraqi Christians. And these are also, you know, ancient movements, ancient, ancient communities um, which are, are being destroyed. So. Hi, I'm Christina Cohn from Smithtown, New York. And I'm interested to know more about the early 20th century in Egypt. Um, because you know it's it's being painted as this this cosmopolitan center certainly with the the Mutmas Rum, but do we know what percentage of society the, the Mutmas Rum was? And, and really, you know, while while it ha might have this cosmopolitan persona where the mass is not enjoying that, um, and am I correct in thinking that because I I've, have never heard this term before that the Mutmas Rum? I, I mean, I know about elites having power, and and my understanding was that they were connected to the, the Khedival regime, if, if I'm even saying that correctly. So is, is, is that correct? Is that really that, that Mutmas Aram that, that has that connection? Um, and then finally, it, so under Nasser, then in the 1950s, when there's this exodus, where did they go? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so again, it's always uh, more complicated than simply. Uh, you're right in saying that. Um, and, I, and I don't know the exact percentage. I think there was, you know, a few hundred thousand Jews and a few hundred thousand Greeks and whatnot. Um, and, you know, um, they were a small percentage of, of society, you know, maybe 5% at the most, something like that. Um, and, and certainly the masses didn't, um, you know, weren't, represent, it, it, it weren't represented, right? It's clearly. Uh, and, and really, uh, you know, in this Jacobian building, um, movie and, and novel, what happens is, you know, these, this very diverse uh, group which leaves is, is re replaced by Arab military officers who come from the countryside, you know, who are part of these masses. And that's very much uh, what happens. It's, it is a sort of democratization of Egypt in, in, in many ways, and that was its, its appeal, I think, for, for a lot of people and why it, why it succeeded. Um, where do these groups come from and who they're connected with, it's, it's different in different places and it's a combination of a number of different things. Um, on one hand, places like Alexandria on the Mediterranean coast had always had, I mean Alexandria is a Greek name, they always had a Greek population there. It had Italians, it had you know, different groups. These Mediterranean communities uh, all over the Mediterranean were, were quite um, diverse and Alexandria was no different. Uh, the same with the Jews in place, places like Cairo, not just in Alexandria, but also in places like Cairo. There was a core of a, of a sort of ancient, not ancient, but a very old Jewish community that had lived there and had been in Egypt since at least the Middle Ages, right? There's Jews that have been, you know, uh, in Egypt. There's evidence of Jews in Egypt all the way back, you know, in, in Roman times, but uh, clearly the community that was there in the early 20th century had been there since, you know, probably at least the Middle Ages, part of it, I should say, part of it. Um, what you have is, um, first with the Khedival, uh, you know, um, regime, which is a sort of part of the Ottoman Empire, um, but so successful that it becomes semi-independent, and then um, the British come in, right, and, and, and this success, first under the Khedival regimes, and then uh, as, a, as a sort of British colony, uh, there's a lot of money and a lot of opportunities, and it draws in people from 
all over. And sometimes um, these groups would be integrated into, um, into new groups, right? So if you're a Greek and you're, you're from Greece and you're coming there and you, there's other Greek communities, you join that Greek community. If you're Jewish, you know, you have connections with this, uh, with this Jewish community. But it also worked the other way around, right? So if you're, you know, uh, an Anglophile Jew and you're coming there and you might, you know, you're maybe, uh, you know, intermarrying and, and the, maybe the, the Egyptian Jews who are there become less Egyptian and more cosmopolitan as this sort of process, uh, as this process takes place. Um, the idea of passports, it's not really, you know, and having foreign citizenship isn't really uh, tied to the Chedaival regime so much. It's more tied to the British and actually colonial rule. Um, the first sort of Western colonial penetration of the Ottoman Empire comes in this term of basically giving out passports and, and, and uh, creating protectorate communities, usually among religious minorities, Christians, Jews, you know, whatever else, uh, and different uh, colonial, Western colonial rulers pick different communities. The French, you know, like the Catholics for you know, different reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, they would sort of be their protectorate, right? And this is sometimes turned into sort of citizenship during uh, later periods because if you are a religious minority or an ethnic minority, it's very, just like today, you know, it's very, if you're in Egypt today and you can get British citizenship, that's a good deal. <laughs> we'll get it, you know. Uh, um, and if they were able to get it, you know, it was really good for them. And they didn't have to go to the Egyptian courts, they'd go to the British courts and, and whatnot, but, you know, obviously that's only good when the British are there, you know, and then after they leave, it's, it's not that good. Um, so, does that answer the question mostly? Yeah. Can you illuminate a little bit more about the Kurds? I understand the Kurds are in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. And Iran now has the identity of a Shia Muslim. Are the Kurds in Iran Shia Muslim? The Kurds are mixed. Are they the same all over? And how does Khomeini deal with the Kurds? Well, the Kurds get played uh, on, on all sides uh, at all times, I think. is <laughs> really since how it happens. Most of the Kurds are Sunni everywhere, but there are Shi Kurds as well. Um, I don't know the exact percentages in Iran, um, but uh, I imagine that's probably the case there as well. There might be more Shi's because it's more beneficial to be a Shi there. Um, so Khomeini deals with the Kurds. In some ways it says, yeah, okay, you're Muslims, you know, it's good, but, uh, you know, they have to um, operate in Persian, they have to learn Persian, which is actually not as bad for the Kurds as some other peoples because Kurdish, while well, it's its own language, um, is close to Persian. It's a Persianate language. So, um, for example, the Azaris, who, that's a Turkic language, uh, have a much more difficult time uh, integrating, right? Because, you know, you have to learn a whole different language where, you know, uh, I've, I've seen, you know, Persians who can get by without very, with very little training in Kurdish, and I imagine in certain dialects of Kurdish, I get Kurdish. Uh, so I imagine it, it works the other way um, as well. But they do use them in this sort of geopolitical manner, right? So when the, when the Kurds get gassed by Saddam, um, the excuse that Saddam uses is, is that they're being used by the Iranians in this sort of guerrilla war against uh, against Iraq, which is an excuse, but it's there's some truth to it as well. Clearly, this is happening. Uh, and this, this predated Khomeini, um, actually. Um, I mean, Iraq had been dealing with the Kurds for some time, and the, and the Iranians had close ties uh, with certain factions of the Kurds, uh, which spanned the border. Um, and in fact, the Iraqis um, had to make a, a number of concessions to the Iranians in 1975 in something called the Algiers Agreement to get the Iranians to stop uh, sort of using the Kurds in this way against the regime to suppress a uh, um, sort of ongoing rebellion in, in, in northern Iraq that was getting support from you know from across the Iranian uh, from across the Iranian border, um, and then when Khomeini came to power, he basically annulled that policy of of of, of stopping you know this interference. Um, so in many ways, he he 
you know, use the Kurds the same that anyone did. You know, we tried to sort of make them more Persian if you could, uh, more Shi if you could, uh, but and would, would also use them in very geopolitical ways to sort of get at his adversaries the same way that you know Turkey does and everyone else. Right? So the Kurds, it's 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 its own language, uh, its own ethnicity, you could say, right? There's a few different dialects of Kurdish, and Mike Reynolds, if he was here, he'd be able to tell you a lot more about it. But um, they are a sort of mountainous people. It's a Persianate language, so it's connected to this. Uh, you know, there's a number of countries um, that fall into this sphere of sort of Persianate ethnicity slash ethno. You know, the, the, obviously the Iranians, the Persians. Um, you know, Afghanistan and uh, Tajikistan, uh, these are all sort of Persianate countries who have a very, you know, similar, uh, a similar language. They were, the Kurds themselves were a very mountainous tribal people, kind of nomads up until the 20th century. Uh, but they have their own political identity, which is as Kurds. Um, and yeah, they're not Arabs, they're not Persians, they're distinct. But they're more closely related to the Persians than they are to the Arabs, I guess you could, you could say that. And that sometimes matters in the geopolitics of, of the region. Uh, Sam, um, even before the crisis with ISIS, um, there was, it was said by some observers that the ties that different groups within Iraq that their allegiance to their group, whether it was religious or, eth or ethnic, was stronger than their sense of being an Iraqi. And some were even moved to say there's no such thing as an Iraqi. So the first part of my question is, is there, an Ira is there such thing as an Iraqi? And now with the ISIS crisis, with Iran in control of one part of the country, ISIS in control of another, the Kurds in control of another, will there be an Iraq? in the future. Okay, so the first part is real easy to answer, mostly because you asked the wrong question. Uh, is there such thing as an Iraqi? Yes. That's not the issue. The question is how many of these Iraqis are there? Um, one way to look at this is um, if you're in Baghdad or Basra and you're a Shi and the Sunni part of the country gets under ISIS and rebels and wants to be its own country. Why do you care? You have, there's no oil there. There's nothing. There's nothing out there that you want or need except for a bunch of people who are trying to kill you. Uh, so what is this sort of urge to keep that on? Kurdistan is different. There's oil up there. There's reasons to keep it. But, but this Sunni area over there, you know, in western Iraq, Alambar province, there's nothing out there. Um, except for some people who hate you. Why would you want it? You know? um, but yet there is still the persistence of, of Shis who insist that Iraq must stay unified. And you know, um, The question is how many of those people are there? And, that, and that's, that's the question right? that, that uh, is more difficult to answer. And the same among, among the Sunnis. Clearly there's some Sunnis who would, uh, and there's less Sunnis that would like to split off and just create the Sunni area for a couple of reasons. Uh, less so because they consider Iraq to be, um, although they do, you know, Sunnis had more than even Shi'is had this idea of Iraq that, that was very important to them, right? Um, but the, uh, you know, for them there's geopolitical reasons to stay unified. One, they have no oil, and two, they don't have Baghdad. So they don't really have anything out, they, you know, they don't, they realize that there's nothing out there, right? So they, they would like to stay part of this, this larger, um, this larger state. The Kurds are a bit different. You'll, you'll be hard pressed to find a Kurd, Kurd, many Kurds who want anything to do with Iraq. Um, they call Iraq a different country, they have a different flag, they, you know, it's, it, it's completely different. So um, whether or not, so the second part of the question is whether or not there will be a future of Iraq. I mean, who knows, right? The, uh, um, the Kurds will probably never come back fully into like a sort of, you know, the Kurds really split off after the Gulf War, right? And they become this sort of independent zone uh, outside the control of Baghdad. Having them back under the control of Baghdad doesn't seem like an option in the near future. Although, uh, 
this is a history institute. So talking about the futures. There's a, I was telling somebody, we, we, we had at Princeton, you know, uh, the famous historian Bernard Lewis, who used to get asked always at a history talk about, well, what's going to happen in the future? And he would always say, you know, I'm a historian, I don't predict the future. And he told the story of one time he said that, and he was at this international gathering, and his Russian Soviet colleagues were tapped him on the shoulder and said, ah, oh, you Americans have it so easy. In Russia, we have to predict the past. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, trying to say what's going to happen in Iraq is really difficult. Hi, I'm Kelsey Bissett from uh, the Hill School in Pottstown. Um, so I have a kind of a two-part question. And part one is whether you've seen a correlation between um, the strength or the amount of neo-imperialistic intervention and then the strength of that sort of forced identity, whether it's kind of a zero-sum piece or whether it's um, more proportionately connected. And then part two is how does this or how doesn't this maybe speak to 21st century intervention, um, either in the region or in specific countries, whether it's like military or economic or, or, or what have you? Yeah, I mean, I haven't looked at it in any, I'm sure some people have tried. Um, it's a complicated question about the give and take. Um, I can give you just my own opinion slash observations which have been, it really doesn't matter um, if there is a sort of intervention or not. Uh, when, I mean, when, when, when there hasn't been interventions, like as in Syria, you know, uh, there are play, people who are going to use that to their political advantage and say, you know, look, they leave us out to dry. These, you know, they, they don't help us when, when, they, when we need help. When there is an intervention, you know, of course, you get the other, the other side of that, which is, you know, look at their coming in here and, and doing this. I mean, Egypt was the greatest case because you had both at the same time during the Arab Spring. You had two groups who one said, you know, the U.S. is, is, is supporting, uh, you know, when the Muslim Brotherhood was in charge, they're supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. They're involved in our politics. This is horrible. Look at this. And the other side saying, the U.S. has not abandoned us and hasn't done anything, right? So in that case, uh, at the same exact moment, by two different parties, the U.S. was both being blamed for being an interventionist neo-imperial power and a power that just left Middle Eastern people to, uh, to their own devices and, and to be um, persecuted and killed. So um, I would love to say that there is some sort of good policy that would end this cycle. Um, I don't see that happening because it's always going to mean someone's political advantage to sort of frame it in whatever way is, is you know, um, useful for them, and both on that side and on the, you know, in the United States as well, right? If you want to invade a country, you know, uh, you can always find, <laughs> find a reason, you know, uh, a good reason to do so, and if you want to stay out, you can always find a good reason, and people will instrumentalize these reasons um, for other purposes. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but it, it, Probably the best I could do. I mean, I guess I'm really cynical on this. So, uh, Samuel, with your permission, I'd like to uh, uh, ask you a sort of substantive or theoretical question. Permission denied. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> I, I think your um, your uh, um, concern that the word anti-colonial may not be particularly useful and that it, it, it overlaps with other, other analytical categories that might be m more useful is, is very well taken. But I think it might be um, a more useful term if it were used in a more precise manner. Um, you could, I think very easily, probably more ably than, than me, you could create a typology of colonial enterprises, um, not just in the Middle East, but looking at the European empires in general. There's a tendency among people who don't know much of the history to think that these, these colonial enterprises were all the same. Yeah. And they were clearly not all the same. And uh, just to start, I can think of at least four different kinds of, um, of relationships between uh, the European powers and various colonies. One would be um, 
uh, settler colonization, where the Europeans really intend to go to a place and live in it. Uh, Algeria, an example for France. Uh, Kenya and Rhodesia, an example for Britain. Um, then the second category would be where the cl colonial power negotiates a special relationship with a place uh, and usually is in league with a local elite um, to do that. Now, in the 19th century, the French relationship with Morocco, for example, I think, um, uh, would fit that, that kind of thing. The latter, a British relationship with the monarchy in Egypt, I think, would look a little bit like that. Then the third category would be where there's a, a kind of indirect colonial rule, uh, but not with a pre-existing pre elite, but with, a, with a, a recruited elite through which the European power will rule more or less indirectly. And there are lots of examples of that uh, in British colonies in West Africa, for example. And then there's the, uh, the direct control, where the colonial um, government will come and actually create an administration for either for economic exploitative purposes or for geostrategic purposes or other purposes. And it seems to me that this gives you a kind of a typology of control or influence that varies pretty much from place to place and from case to case. And then when you look at what happens when the colonial power leaves, it seems to me that, that what kind of colonial enterprise you started with will have a huge bearing on what happens after the colonial power, how the, the, the colonial power departs and what happens after the colonial power departs. Now, to the best of my knowledge, and my knowledge on, of the literature is limited, I've never seen a book where anybody drilled down into the, to the typology of colonialism well enough in order to, you know, to base a thick description on this kind of, these, this kind of an analytical distinction. Yeah. So if I'm wrong about that, if there are such books that do this carefully, I'd like to know what they are. But I think if, if people you know, uh, are, are more precise in the sociological definition of what the colonial power actually does, then the term might become more useful. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, you're, you're probably right. And my point wasn't to take sides, I guess, in the debate. And I'm sorry if I uh, gave the impression that I was saying one is, uh, you know. Um, no, not at all, yeah. not at all. But uh, I, I was just trying to give the sort of range of, of what people do say about uh, this term. I think you're right, there are different types of colonialism. And there have been some work on this, um, mostly not in the same typology that you created, although that is a certainly legitimate way to classify it, but um, there's been work about, you know, the difference between the British and the French, for example, which had very different ways of ruling, you know, Iraq and Syria or Egypt, you know, these are, the British were much more ruling through local elites uh, without the intent of actually making uh, people British, you know, um, whereas the French were very much more interested in creating French um, citizens um, and you know, this had, had, of course, had legacies, and, and, you know, it's not that one was, the British, you know, now sort of look a little bit, it looks a little bit nicer because they had a little bit more hands off and were less intrusive and maybe less violent in some cases, but, you know, the French maybe instincts were nicer because the British instincts were those people can never be sort of <laughs> like us, and the French were, no, they can be, they just need, you know, uh, you know. Uh, they can be Western and enlightened and whatever the French, you know, have viewed themselves. Um, so there has been some work on that, um, you know, and the, there are some uh, typologies of empire, right? There's another type. If you put, if you have this spectrum that you kind of laid it up, you could put, you know, even you could put the United States on the far end of this spectrum where there is no actual formal rule over a place like Bahrain or United Arab Emirates or some other uh, small place that kind of has to do what we say. Um, you know, and you know, have the even lightest footprint possible, but whether or not this is still an, an imperial uh, system. And then you have, of course, you know, what I mentioned, the post-colonialists who, who would say it doesn't matter if you've ever even had any relation. You know, it's just the sort of categories you're using to discuss the world around you, uh, which you have imposed on the rest of the world and sort of ruled through this, uh, this type of epistemology. Um, but, yeah, I don't know of anyone who's, who's gone out to say, okay, this is, the, you know, a typology of colonialism and these are the different results that came out of it. There have been, your friend, Francis Fukuyama, in his last book, does something like this with political institutions that the colonial uh, leaders left behind. In fact, Costa Rica 
the example I used up here, I, I took that from his book. He spends quite a long time on Costa Rica. Um, so he talks about the different institutions that different types of colonial rule left in different types of places and how this interacted with the indigenous institutions to produce um, an outcome. But even there, it's different because places like East Asia where there were um, strong indigenous political institutions before colonial rule ended up different than Africa where, you know, um, there was really not that many political institutions at all and the colonial leaders left very weak footprint um, in Africa, no matter what kind of rule they, whether it was settler, colonial, settler colonialism or a very light footprint, they just didn't leave much behind in Africa and uh, that has been, um, at least in his words, uh, uh, a not so pleasant legacy for, for Africa. Um, but yeah, it's a good project. You know anyone working on a dissertation? You know. <laughs> I think uh, actually we have to bring this back. Oh, okay. Up.